sodas and lotions. And we have many who use those lotions, saying that they're very good for the skin. So if you're interested in your skin, please purchase this product and help the outreach teams. In Pangyo Temple, we have we always have problems with parking, and uh, we just had some government officials who have called us. Uh, there are some people who are parking at um, a high school nearby, the Pangyo Temple, and they have said that not to park there anymore. And they gave warnings that they will be um, putting on stickers for all the parts, for all the cars that will be parked there um, starting next week. And what is the church? We have been trying very hard to find some new parking lots for you, for, uh, for the commerce onto our school. And we have three parking lots outside of our church. If you are want to know these places, uh, please ask your mokjons about it. One of it is at the Jap World, Jap Korea, which is about located in about five minutes from our Pangyo Temple. We have some members of our church who recently some family members. Um, the pastor is calling out some of the family members. As the family members stand up, uh, let us wave our bulletin to send them our condolences. We pray that they will remain into the community, receive help, Um, Pastor Kim, Reverend Kim, she went to participate the World Missionary Festival, and she was called as one of the speakers there. We are all one, and as we prayed together as one for her, even in the midst of the hot weather, Pastor Kim, she participated in each one of her um, schedule. Um, it was a tight schedule, but she safely finished um, her schedules and came back. Um, please keep your prayers for her. The pastor who will be speaking today is Pastor Kwon Gu Hyun. From, he is the main pastor of Sunlim Methodist Church, which is a big church. Uh, in Korea. And, um, you know, this pastor, he actually is a pastor that has it all. Uh, he will speak more for himself, but uh, he has a big church. Um, you know, he has a big crowd who will be listening to him. He will speak more about it later on. But um, let us see what he has to say. Let us prepare our hearts as we worship our Lord. My God, my King, I lift your name up high. And forever I will Bless your name. Lord God, we stand in your temple. Let me see my sin. Let me share it. Let me confess it. Let me repent. Let me be forgiven. 
Let your miracle happen today. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Nice to meet you. I am Pastor Kwon Kru Yeon from Sunlin Methodist Church. Um, Pastor Lee Sung Woon from Wilco Church called me and I thought it was a dream. How dare would I be able to stand and preach at Wilco Church? And I thought that, oh, I should, I should say no, but um, for each and every one of you at Wilco Church, you obey to your spiritual authority, right? And similarly, I have received training and I was nurtured at Wurdu Church. I am just like you. And you have taught me. You have shown me how to obey. And similarly, I stand here today in a heart of obedience. And I usually, I rarely get nervous. But for the past two weeks, I don't know how many times I sighed and expressed my anxiety to my wife. And my wife, um, you know, she tried her best to comfort me. Anyways, um, I give my respect to each and every one of you, all the Chowon Jigis who preach every Wednesday. Um, two days ago, my daughter, she told me that she dreamt of me standing at Wood of the Church during worship. And first I thought, oh, so this is the way God comforts me. But then she followed up by saying, Dad, you were standing on the stage, but you were so funny. I guess um, me standing up to preach at Will the Church is funny, even to my own daughter. Uh, when I listened to Pastor Kim Young Jae's sermons, um, I hoped to come to Will the Church and participate on worshiping. To witness the word of the community and I had a really big heart yearning to be here but I did not expect it in this way um, preaching mm. and it was my hope I should be standing with you guys, but I am here standing to preach. And what is the church? I'm just blessed to be here. And, um, you know, there are some people at my church, at Sunlin Church, they say, Pastor Kwon, how come you always speak about Pastor Kim Young Jae these days? Um, you changed the early morning sermons to QT in passage. You preach Sunday sermons with Pastor Kim's sermons. You lead Wednesday service with Pastor Kim's books. And you keep telling us to see our own sin. It's our church. I stop ministry for what is the church. But you see, um, it is not possible for everyone at Sunlin Church to come here and receive uh, the nurturing program and training. So I have been trying my best to share what I have learned from Pastor Kim's sermons for the past seven months. Even my, even uh, my wife's <laughs> mother said to my son, "Hey, how long will your dad be speaking using Pastor Kim's, Pastor Kim's sermons?" And my son had told his grandmother, "Until the day your eyes are opened <laughs> to see your own sins." I truly hope that Sunlin Church was a sub-ministry for what is the church. Why? Because I really hope that everyone at our church will be nurtured through what is the programs. But that is not possible. So as I heart yearning that each and every one of them be you know, nurtured, especially the Joshua QT um, sermon series that Pastor Kim has shared. That's something that I really hope that my I would like to share to our brothers and sisters in our church. And I think it is such a blessing for each and every one of you at Wood of the Church who gets to listen to Pastor Kim's sermons every week. 
October last year, I participated in the pastoral QT seminar. And since, since then, I have experienced the biggest change in my ministry, in my 22 years of ministry. And um, today, I would like to share how me and Sunland Church have been experiencing such change. Uh, my testimony is about a loser uh, who is an amateur when it comes to QT. And that is my life. Though I have been a pastor leading a church for 22 years, I am still an amateur when it comes to QT. And when I told my wife that I will be giving my testimony instead of actually preaching, my wife told me, you're trying to just make things easy and take the easy way, huh? But you know, you know, before receiving training at Wurudo Church, I had an anger management issues. But even after my wife's criticism, I was not angry. And this is all thanks to each and every one of you at Wurudo Church who have opened up your sins and shames to use as remedy and cure for other people, for me. And even though I'm ashamed, I would like to share a little bit about myself. Again, um, I would like to thank Pastor Kim and the members of Wuredo Church. Um, I received the Think Training Nurturing Program through online Zoom um, last year. Uh, due to COVID protocol, I received it online. And um, my nurturing mentor was Cho Won Jigi Song Nan Suk. And one day she asked me, Pastor, what are your sins? And I answered, well, I was born in a Christian uh, family. My father was a pastor. I went to theology school and I went to study abroad. I was a missionary. I came back to Korea and I became a leader of a church. So I never committed it. I never committed any big crime, um, nor have I ever committed any big sin. And um, the Chuan Jigi she replied, "Wow, you are such a jip tang. You're such a big jip tang." In the beginning, I thought it was a compliment. I did not know what jip tang meant. And jip tang, you know, since I did not know what it meant, I thought it was a compliment. But the following week, Pastor Kim shared about jip tang it was do tang jip tang and jip tang um, is a word that pastor kim uses and it means the prodigal son who stays at home so jip tang means the prodigal son the prodigal son who stays at home so i realized that not only am i a jip tang i actually am the prodigal son who enjoyed the pleasures of this world when nobody was watching you know, when I heard about Pastor Kim's Jip Tong um, sermons, I got to see about myself. You know, even though I was raised in a pastor's kid, I pretended to be righteous. I was filled with self-righteousness. And I sought after righteousness inside the law, acting all holy and righteous while um, I was getting further away from Christ and grace. And my father was a pastor, so I pretended to be holy, I pretended to be righteous, and I thought that was myself. I thought I was holy and righteous. I was fooling other people, I was fooling myself. Ever since elementary school, my nickname was Pastor Kwon. Why? Because I was so good at acting as a pastor. I was a role model student on the outside, but on the inside, I always judged and criticized other people. I want to be uh, recognized as a role model student. I wanted recognition from other people, so I held all of the leadership position and built my reputation. I was like, oh, I'm gonna be, you know, the representative, the representing student of our school, of my class. And I built all of these specs. So on the outside, I seemed all good, but on the inside, I was filled with fear and worries 
you know, I, I was worried to receive uh, respect from other people. On the outside, you know, I pretended to be all busy, all kind, all warm. But at places when there were nobody watching, I was lazy, I was procrastinating, and I get I got angered easily to my family. I was jealous, I was envious. And I wanted to achieve my plans. I got angry when other people did not family uh, did not follow me. And I majored in counseling, so I was really good with techniques of pretending to empathize with other people, but in reality, I could not empathize. So I was really good at acting, and I lived a double life. At home, I was a king who sat on throne. I was a missionary in Pakistan, and I followed the elite course um, studying in the States. And I had um, this greed of receiving respect. I wanted to be respected by other people. And I used all of my specs for what? To receive my father's church. Since my father was a successful church, he had free ticket to receive my father's church. And I had to build my spec um, to be recognized. I was you know, at one of the graduate, top graduates in a church, at the other church. I went to study in America. I was a missionary in Pakistan. I pretended to be humble, but I was not. Even after becoming a pastor, my sermons, I preached about words that hurted, that penetrated the hearts of the brothers and sisters in our church. I was criticizing them, hurting them, judging with the laws. Why? Because I was not opened. I was blind to the word of God. I had a spiritual famine inside of me, and I did not even recognize it. My spiritual state, it was as if I was in the land of Moab, but I thought that was a blessing from God. Why? Because on the outside, I participated heavily on missionary trips. I was the deacon in a, in a church. I had a lot of places, a lot of status to boast about myself. I did not know that it was sin. And for one year, I went abroad 16 times to participate in mission trips, to speak at churches. But you know, I was a leader, the lead pastor of a church. But going abroad 16 times, do you think I could have led properly? I was so arrogant and prideful. You know, Pastor Kim Young Jae, she recommended me to participate in the pastoral seminar eight years ago. She even texted me personally. But uh, my pride did not accept it. Why? Because I thought that I should be invited as a speaker, not as a participant. That was my pride. So because of it, my spiritual desert, my spiritual famine, it continued to grow. So that's the reason why God led me to meet Pastor Kim personally at that funeral. So Pastor Kim said, you know, this year we're going to have it online. We're going to have the Petro Seminar online. So you must participate. So she forced me to make a promise with her to participate um, in Woody the Church, a uh, pastoral seminar through online, through Zoom. So she started the pastoral seminar with the Book of Ruth. And on her, that very first day, I was struck. I realized that I am in a spiritual famine. 
where I cannot see my own sins, where I cannot hear the word of God. Still, I had a habit of judging other people, of criticizing other people, so I criticized Pastor Kim. So I thought, still, you know, confessing sins in front of the entire community, that is very dangerous. And I had at my doubts. And I thought, hey, we're not Catholic. Why should we, you know, confess our sins? I was still filled with worldly values. I was still filled with humanistic perspective. So that was my state when I first participated in the pastoral seminar. And as a, as a part of the program, the nurturing program, I participated in the Mokjang. And I was so shocked with all of the confession of sins in the Mokjangs. And I was so surprised when the Mokjas, when the Chonjigis, when the leaders, they uh, recommended the applications to the Mokwans. They were very bold. And the Mok Mokja uh, and the Mokwans, the peoples, they obeyed to the spiritual authorities. They said yes to whatever the Mokjas had to say. And on another Mokja, on the male Mokja, they confessed about their lust, about their own affair they had, about their gambling. And it was all a shock to me. They were, you know, laughing about it, joking about it. They were very open with their sins. I mean, I heard that in Woody the Church, they had a community of people who shared about their affairs. Hearing about it and actually witnessing, it was very different. And there was also testimony festivals about people who shared about their homosexuality sins, about their affairs, about their lust. And that was a shock. And I realized that my ministry of 22 years was wrong. A community that opens up about their sins and a community that accepts these testimonies, that was a shock. And I thought about what is the fundamental of a ministry. The sins, the shames you have opened up, these are not to be criticized, to look down upon. But they are the cross, the nail that Jesus Christ was nailed on the cross. The blood that He shared. That was the remedy and the cure of our sins. And those were the remedy and cures for my sins as well, for me as well. I realized that I was such a hypocrite. I realized how many layers of pride and arrogance of fake mask that I've been wearing. For, I registered for the Think Nurturing Program with my wife. It was an opportunity for me to truly reflect on my own sins. When I, had, when I fought my wife, my wife always told me, I want to die, I want to get a divorce. I want to live not with you, but with that person over there. So these were the words that my wife told me when we had a fight. Even, even before I die, I want to reveal what a hypocrite you are in front of all of the people. And each and every time my wife says such things, I thought, how can she say such things to a person like me? And I could not empathize with my wife. I looked down upon her. I did not know what a grave state I was in. My wife, she graduated on the same theology school as me. She received uh, her pastoral degree. She was, a minister, she, went, she was a missionary to Pakistan just like me. She studied at Emory School of Theology. And she came to Korea to get her doctoral degree in counseling but I looked down upon her. Every time I said the same thing, 
You don't know. You should just stay still. That is the way to help me. Don't you? Can't you see that I'm preparing for my Sunday preach? I ignored her. And I took my status as a father, as the leader of our household. But on the outside, I pretended to be a cool American dad who respected my wife. That's the double life that I live. You know, a few years ago, my wife told me, if our second son graduates, I'm going to get a divorce. My wife, she is a pastor as well. But she said that she wanted to get a divorce. But it is very strange. God stopped. God <laughs> blocked my son to uh, graduate from uh, college so that me and my wife could not get a divorce. You know, my, my second son, she, he could not uh, you know, enter. She, he could not get an admission to a college. It was a plan of God. My wife, she received the Think Nurturing program. And I would really like to thank um, the Chowon Jigi who nurtured my wife. I mean, we were nurtured through Zoom, right? Um, my, we were in separate rooms, me and my wife, and we received the training um, through Zoom. At lunch, one, uh, you know, she came out. And when she went, came out of the room, she was always in tears. And she started applying what she had learned in her life. And she told me, I fooled you. Thank you for living with me. So these were the confessions that my wife said to me. And when she said so, I realized that I was the deceiver as well. Both at church and both at home, I was the rotten bread. I was a fool who pretended to be holy. I deceived everyone and I deceived myself. And you see, I can't sleep when I drink coffee. But on Sunday, you know, since I have to lead many sermons, I drink coffee in the morning, um, during lunch at night, I drink about two to three cups of coffee on Sundays. And after when the day is finished, it is really hard for me to sleep at night on Sunday because I, I drink two, three cups of coffees. And when my wife is not looking, I watch YouTube and TikTok all night. At church, I say to people, I don't watch TV well, I don't watch dramas well, which is true. I don't watch K-drama, I don't watch TV. But you see, I watch YouTube and TikTok all night. And as you know, YouTube knows what you know I like, right? The algorithm. And even though I don't look for it, the algorithm shows everything that I have not watched but that I am interested in. And it shows me more something that is more fun, something that is more lustful, something that is more adult 19 plus. So that's the way I am led to um, sin through YouTube algorithm. And I wanted something that would excite me more. It does not stop in YouTube. I want actually enter, I sought after actual uh, adult video sites to watch porn. I repented, of course, I repent. And there are months that I, I you know, try not to watch porn for a month. But in the end, I was led back to porn again. On Sunday, I pretend to be holy. I preach in front of the people. And on Saturday, since I don't lead, I lead on uh, Friday night sermons. And at nights, I indulge myself in sin. And you, for the first time, I opened up about my sin, about my sexual sins to the community. 
and in front of the entire church. Confessing my sin in front of the entire community, I got to experience for the first time of sin losing its power. Yes, I still sin. But in my dreams, I had the power to break the shackles of sin. I got to share about my sins. I got to share about the nurturing program that I have received. How I gained the strength to confess about my sins. About the nurturing program at Wurido Church. But you know, still many people, they cannot... It, it, it does not go to them, you know? They do not understand that. Why? Because of our traditions in Methodist Church. You know, when John Wesley, Pastor John Wesley first um, formed this Methodist Church, it was just like Wurido Church. It was about confession of sins. That was very important. You know, Pastor John Wesley, she had five questions that each and every one of the members had to confess. And the five questions were, first, what sins have you committed since our last meeting? Second, what temptations have you received? Third, how did you escape from such temptations? Fourth, what are your thoughts and words? You are not sure if it is not sin or not. Five, do you have a secret that you wish to hide from others? So these were the five questions that the early Methodist Church had to share and Pastor John Wesley created. But after Pastor John Wesley passed away, people started to say, this is unrealistic. This is very pious. So slowly, those kind of sin confession slowly faded of Methodist Church. And I see this tradition, this culture, being revived in Wurido Church, the confession of sin. In 21st century, in Wurido Church, it is a lifestyle, it is a culture, it is amazing, it is shocking. And to all the pastors that I've met, I share about it to them. And I tell them, you know, the church that is more met, more like a Methodist church than the early Methodist church, that's Wurido Church, but people, the pastors, do not believe. I finally got to realize that I am a 100% sinner in front of God. I admitted that, you know, I was not open, that my eyes and ears were not open to the Word of God. I got to confess about my true state, about my desire of recognition, about my pride, about my arrogance, about my lust, about my idolatry for the succession of my kids. I repented. So I started to nurturing the leaders of our church um, the similar way the Wurido Church has been nurturing. Um, in our church, we have 21 elders and 19 of them participated in my nurturing. From 9 p.m. on Friday until 12.30, on sometimes until 1 a.m. I confessed my sins and they have confessed their sins. I confessed my sins and the elders said, oh, I did not know that you have committed the sins. But you know, we are all sinners. So they have shared their sins as well. Every Friday night. I did not receive a uh, the leader nurturing in uh, Wurido Church. So I am just a half um, nurturer since I did not receive the leadership program in Wurido Church. But still, God worked through us. I have returned after sharing my sins and the elders returned to their home sharing their sins. Still, we have a long way to go. We are still an amateur. We are still a child. But you know, confessing our sins, repenting, the life and the confession, the testimony that we little, little community have shared. We have been eating, we have been receiving the remedy, we have been following the steps in our church. It was something that I wanted to build in our church as well. So slowly, we have been changing. My ministry has been changing. In the very beginning, 
they didn't understand why you know I started confessing my sins. You know, I actually confessed my sins before coming to Widow Church as well. But you know, my confessions of sin, you know, I do not really confess my own sin, but I kind of kind of camouflaged it, saying it was our sin. I said everything is because of the grace of God, thanks to the grace of God. I did not know, but I was boasting about my goodness, all the success of my life. You know, six years ago, I led a vision care project to help those with problem with eyesight, so people who were blind. But you know, I was the one who was blind. Why did I do it? Because I actually wanted to drive a motorbike. You know, it was a campaign that was leading people riding motorbikes as well. You know? Instead of giving God all the glory, I actually slowly boasted how you know all I get all how all of the hard works that I have given through. I said, oh, give God all the glory, but I was actually boasting about myself. You know, it was an important work. It was an important ministry. You know, it was going to Africa, riding motorbikes in nine countries of Africa. It was going with all of the doctors to give med free medical treatments. It's a very wonderful ministry, right? Because in Africa, they don't have um, doctors. So that's why receiving free medical treatment is very, it's an important ministry. Even though people have money, they don't have doctors. And many people are blind, but they don't have the technology to receive eyesight program. Even, even some very simple eye program, they don't have it in Africa. But you know, actually people, you know, if you, it's very easy, it's much easier to drive using a bus, right? But I forced that we had to ride motorbikes. Why? Because it was, it was something that I really wanted to do. I gave all of these different reasons why we need to ride motorbikes, but it was actually because of my uh, vision because of my greed, I, because of my desire to ride motorbikes. There were times I preached right on wearing the motorbike vests. Many people knew and talked behind my back, said, oh man, if it's much easier to drive bus, why do you have to drive motorbikes? It's all because of pastor's desire of motorbikes. But I was blind for it. Inside, I have said, you know, I'm giving all of my efforts to do such a great ministry. You know, driving a motorbike is just a simple thing. I was blind. I'm giving all of this for God. Riding a motorbike is such a small thing. But all of this... How could I see my sins? How did I got to see that it was all because of my desire to see to ride motorbikes? It was all thanks to you. You have first opened up about your sin within the church, about your shame. As you opened up, I slowly got to see about my sin as well. And as I opened my sins about my shame to in our church at Sunny Church, there are people who slowly started to see their own sins in, so, in Sunday church as well. Pastor Kim preached about the one deceived, the one who deceives as well. After I turned on about such sermon at our church, one of the deaconess gave me a text at Sunday church. She said, hearing the some, such sermon, I must confess my sin. I pretended to be righteous, but when I go back home, I wanted to divorce my husband. If I had a gun, I wanted to shoot him dead. Now I repent, and I will decide to live as a serpent, servant and obey to my husband. And 
And when I opened up about this in our church, that I received such text, you know, nobody, none of the male deacon smiled. Why? Because they were all afraid that this was a text from their own wife. And also I received another text and they said, for three years, um, I did not come to church, I only worshipped online. And they have listened to my sermon, you know, for the first time in three years. Ever since I did not come to worship, today was the first day in three years um, that, I wor particip uh, that I listened to uh, Son in Church. And hearing your confession of sin, I am in tears. We have received so many hurts at church. And we also had to receive a lot of couples counseling. At times, people, um, they criticized us. And they said they judged us according to the law. And back then, maybe it was not your... You did not meant to hurt us, but we were hurt.